بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته ما شاء الله Dear brothers and sisters in Islam I would like to welcome you to another Tuesday night tafsir lesson and alhamdulillah as you know we have been doing this lesson for the last three years we've started the lesson uh, 2019 November 2019 that's when we started the tafsir and and then we had the COVID and then while we had the COVID we still continued doing the lesson via Zoom and then alhamdulillah after the COVID and alhamdulillah we got better or things have improved we came back uh, to the masjid alhamdulillah and we started the tafsir of the quran and by going through juz amma alhamdulillah we've completed all of juz amma and then after that we have completed the 29th juz, juz which is tabarak until suratul mursalat and recently we've started the the 28th juz which begins with qasam allah qawl allati tujadiluka fi zawjiha uh, Surah 57 of the Quran and then now we are in Surah Al-Jumu'ah so tonight we are beginning a new Surah a new journey so Surah Al-Jumu'ah so Qad Allahu Qawl Allati was Surah number 58 and then Surah 59 was Surah Al-Hashr Surah 60 was Surah Al-Mutahina Surah 61 was Surah Al-Saf so this Surah is going to be Surah number 60 Two, yeah, excellent. So, if you want to, inshallah ta'ala, uh, find where the surah is, it's surah 62. It begins with Yusabbihu lillahi ma fi samawat wa ma fi al-ard, al malik al quddus al aziz al hakim. And remember, subhanallah, and when we recite the Quran and when we study the tafsir of the Quran, the translation of the Quran, you even looking at the kitab and the mushaf itself, you will get ajr for that because you're looking at the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you have the Quran in front of you and you open the kitab and you follow the tafsir, alhamdulillah, you get that extra ajr as well. So we are going to begin Surah uh, Al-Jum'ah. This surah, as you can see, it has been named after the day of Jum'ah, the day of Jum'ah, the day of Friday. Okay, the day of Friday, we'll talk about what it used to be known as. The day of Friday was always not called the day of Friday. It used to be called the day of al uruba The day of al uruba That's what the Arabs used to call the Friday, the day of al uruba We'll talk about the history of the day of, uh, the day of Friday when we get to that ayah, insha'Allah ta'ala. But before we get to that ayah, we will begin with the first ayah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us, يُسَبِّحُ لِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ Everything in the heavens and earth glorifies Allah. The controller, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's al-malik. Okay, he is Allah, he is what? Al-malik, the king, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, the sovereign of everything. He's the king of everything. He's the one who owns everything. I am, I am the king, I am the owner of my car, but I am not the king of the car. Okay, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is the king, he is the owner, and he is the king of everything. Al-Malik, also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of his names is Al-Quddus. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his name is Al-Quddus. And what does Al-Quddus mean? What it means is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's perfect. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from any shortcomings. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's perfect from anything which brings about or we can say al-quddus allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he's pure from anything any deficiencies allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is free from any deficiencies al-malik al-quddus as-salam also it can be translated as the holy one allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then al-aziz another name allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he's the al-aziz so it can be translated as the almighty al-aziz the almighty Okay, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's not only the almighty, but also he 
he is the respectful one. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he also has, he is the one that deserves respect. Al-Hakim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is the all wise. Whatever Allah does, there is a wisdom behind it. There's a wisdom behind it. For example, when Allah created me, the way he created me, there is a wisdom behind it. Why did he create me? There's a wisdom behind it. Why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed me to live the length of time that I'm going to live for? There's a reason. Why do I have, for example, 10 brothers and two sisters? There's a wisdom behind it. So all of this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, some of us, we have only one brother or one sister. Some of us, we have two brothers, two sisters. Some of us, we have big families. Some of us, we have small families. Some of us are rich. Some of us, some of us are poor. Some of us have got names, like they, 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 they are well-known people. Some of us are not known. Okay, so some of us are very intelligent people, some of, some of us are less intelligent. Some of us are rich, some of us are poor. There's hikmah behind it, there's a wisdom behind it. So people right now, they complain and they say, why do we have evil on this earth? Why do we have evil in this earth? If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is kind, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful, why, why some people are suffering? They don't understand the wisdom behind it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, imagine if we didn't know what suffering was, would we have known what, for example, uh, not suffering would have been? Okay, if you don't know what is, if you don't, if you don't have evil, would we know what good is? We wouldn't know what good is if we didn't have evil. So you need to have evil in order to, for you, in order for you to understand what good is. Okay, imagine if all of us were very healthy, all of us we were very healthy. We never needed to go to the hospital or doctors. What would have happened? Would we have needed doctors? Would we have needed nurses? Would we, have, we would not have needed them all. Because some of us have to become unwell, so they need to go to the doctors. So, okay, imagine if all of us were engineers and we knew how to build our houses. <laughs> okay, if we were all the same, identical. Okay, imagine if every one of us was rich, every one of us uh, was healthy, every one of us, one of us was capable of doing whatever they want to do. There would be nothing. Life would not have made any sense at all, khas. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's al-hakim. Okay, he's the all-wise. So whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does and, and, and plans, there's no one who can complain about it. We must never ever complain about the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Allah, he's going to tell us also something else about himself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's not only the king, he's not only the one who is al-Quddus, free from any imperfection, He's not only the one who is Al-Aziz, Al okay, the Almighty, the powerful, respectful one, and he's not only the wise, he was also the one who made the decision to send the unlettered people a messenger who was from them. Allah has said, it is he who raised a messenger among the people who had no scripture. Okay, the Arabs, they didn't have, they were the unlettered people. The Prophet wasallam, when he was born in Mecca, the majority of the people of Mecca, they didn't know how to read and write. Many of them, they didn't know how to read and write. Only few people were able to read and write. The Prophet ﷺ himself, he didn't know how to read and write. Okay, for the Prophet ﷺ, for the Prophet ﷺ not to be able to read and write, that was a miracle for the Prophet ﷺ. So if he was a man who wasn't able to read or write, how would he come up with the Qur'an? How could he have come up with the Qur'an? How could he have copied from somebody else? Because he would have easily been accused of what? Copying the Qur'an from somewhere else. But since Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us he didn't know how to read and write, you can see the Qur'an is a miracle. The Prophet sallallahu himself not being able to read and write and, and then being able to, mashallah, uh, come up with the Qur'an which wasn't his Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given it to him as a gift so he can share it with us. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, rasulan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is Allah? He's the one who has raised a messenger among the people who had no scripture, meaning the unlettered people, the Arabs. Fil rasulan minhum, a messenger who was from them. Okay, the Prophet sallallahu he was from Quraysh. He was from Quraysh. And the Prophet sallallahu he is the product of the dua. The Prophet sallallahu he is the product of the dua of Prophet Ibrahim. What do I mean by that? The Prophet ﷺ, he is the product of the dua of Prophet Ibrahim. 
Prophet Ibrahim thousands of years ago, he made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where he has asked Allah when he was in the Kaaba. He asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, bring from the offspring of Prophet Ismail a messenger. Okay, and from the offspring of Prophet Ismail was the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself, our messenger. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Rasulan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Rasulan minhum, a messenger who's from them, yatlu alayhim ayatid. This messenger, what is he doing? He's going to do four things. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his job was these four things. Okay, what was the role of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? To do the next four things. What was number one? Yatlu alayhim ayatihi. To recite his revelation to the people. To recite his revelation to them. So that was the job of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was reciting the Quran to the people. Just imagine, there was a day, there was a day when a man who was called Al-Walid ibn Mughira came to the Prophet He was told, go and convince Muhammad to change his mind and to make him abandon the religion of Islam and the Quran. So this man who was, a, who was an elder from Quraysh, Al-Walid ibn Mughira, who was the father of who? Khalid ibn Walid. Khalid ibn Walid, his father, was very intelligent man. He was super rich. He was the chieftain, the chieftain of the tribe of Mahzum. And he was very eloquent in his speech. And he was also a poet. So he was tasked and he was given the role and the job to go and speak to the Prophet Sallallahu to speak with him and convince him that he should actually abandon the message that he came with. So one of the things he asked him was like, he, he sat down with the Prophet Sallallahu he said to him, Ya Muhammad, are you better, are you better or your grandfather, Abdul Muttalib was better? Just imagine, he said, are you better or your grandfather was better than you? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he didn't, he didn't answer. He didn't say, I am better than my grandfather or oh, my grandfather is better than me. What was he trying to say to him? He was saying to him like, your grandfather was upon our religion. Okay, your grandfather was our leader once upon a time. <coughs> Abdul Muttalib was the leader of Quraysh. We respected him, we loved him, he was the man. Okay, and he was a very intelligent man. Are you better than him? If the Prophet Sallallahu says, I am better than him, that's gonna be a problem. Okay, if he says that he's better than me, that's also another problem. So look at how the Prophet ﷺ answered. He, he, he stayed silent. He didn't answer that question. And one of the, one of the other things he said to him was like, and Al-Walid ibn Mughira said to him, was like, Ya Muhammad, if you want, if, if what you brought, which is the Quran, the reason you have brought it, if it is that you are looking for leadership, tell us and we will make you our king. We will, we will actually kind of like sort out a kingship for you. Okay, we never had a king as Arabs, okay, or as Quraysh, we never had a king before, but we will actually create that role for you so you can become our king. Tell us if you want that. So they want the Prophet to compromise. And he said to him, if you, if you want a lot, if you want money and wealth, that's what is making you come up with the Quran. If you want money, tell us. We will give you money and we will make you the richest one of us. The Prophet mm -hmm. is still quiet. And then he said to him, if you want to marry the most beautiful woman of Quraysh, we will make sure that we get you married to the most beautiful woman from Quraysh. The Prophet was, he stayed silent, never, never answered anything. Also he said to him, Ya Muhammad, if you are, if you are mentally unwell, if you're sick, and uh, if, if maybe a jinn has done something to you, we can actually get the best doctors and we can help you get better. The Prophet وسلم, when Al-Walid has said to him whatever he wanted to say, the Prophet وسلم, the last thing he said to him was like, Afaragta ya Aba, ya, ya Aba Al-Walid, are you done right now? Did you say everything you wanted to say? And Al-Walid said, yes, I said everything I wanted to say. And now the Prophet what did he do? He started reciting Surah Tufusilat. He said, Hameen. 
تنزيل من الرحمن الرحيم كتاب فصلت آياته قرآن This is why am I telling you this The job of the Prophet was to do what? To recite the Quran to the people So the Prophet recited Surah Hamim Tanzeel Min Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim And then when, Allah, when the Prophet has reached this ayah فَإِنْ أَعْرَضُوا فَقُلْ أَنْذَرْتُكُمْ صَاعِقَةً مِثْلَ صَاعِقَةِ عَادٍ وَثَمُونَ Al-Waleed, he was able to understand the Quran word by word, letter by letter because his Arabic was perfect So he put his hand around the mouth of the Prophet and he said to him, please stop, do not continue reciting this is too much for me because the Quran was impacting Walid and Walid whose job was to change the Prophet to, to make him abandon his religion now he's going to go back to his people Quraysh but as a different man and as he was approaching the leaders of Quraysh they have recognized the Walid that has left them to speak to the Prophet and the Walid that came back after he spoke to the Prophet were two different people so the Prophet what was his job? To recite the Quran to the people. So, The Quran, when the Quran is recited and the person understands, understands the Quran, the Quran impacts the person. Umar ibn al-Khattab, before he became a Muslim, he was someone who was hard-hearted. Subhanallah, he had no mercy. He used to beat up the Muslims. Especially, he used to beat up not only the Muslim men, he also used to beat up the Muslim women. Subhanallah. He used to beat them up. Some of the Muslim women who became Muslim at the early days of, of, of Mecca, he used to beat them up, beat them up until he becomes tired and he would leave and rest for a bit and come back and beat them up. So that was how Umar was. And when Umar became Muslim and the Quran has changed him, what happened? Umar radiallahu anhu, he used to have two lines, two black lines running down his cheek. Why? Because he used to cry so much whenever he hears the Quran and recites the Quran or whenever he prays at night, he would cry so much. So his, his tears ran down his cheek so many times that they actually left black marks on his face. The Quran is so powerful. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Huwa ba'atha fil ummiyyina rasoolan minhum yatlu alayhim ayati. That's the first job the Prophet is doing. The second job is, we use a key to purify them. We need to purify ourselves spiritually. Okay, what does the Quran do? The Quran changes you, it purifies your heart. If you have jealousy, if you are an envious person, if you are somebody who envies other people, the Quran is going to change you. You're not going to have that jealousy. If you're someone who's arrogant, the Quran has to purify you and make you someone who's not arrogant. If, you're st if you still have arrogancy, it means that the Quran has not penetrated your heart yet. Okay, if you're arrogant, you look down upon people. You look, look, look down upon the people and you say like, look who I am, I'm, I'm better than you. I'm more stronger, okay, I'm more intelligent than you. So you are arrogant, the Quran hasn't changed yet. The Quran is supposed to change you. Well, you're Zakim, to purify. Okay, for example, the Quran, should make you a better person when it comes to like you don't backbite people you don't say bad things about other people Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said in surah to surah al-hujurat ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu la yaskhar qawman min qawmin asa an yakunu khayran minhum O oh, you who believe not let not some of you ridicule other muslims sometimes you hear some muslims ridiculing other muslims they're saying like a group of Muslims, an individual is going to say that group of Muslims, this is what's wrong with them. That person, this is what's wrong with him. That person, this is what's wrong with him. What are you doing? You are actually doing backbiting. Okay. Do not ridicule other Muslims. Also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, Those people who are trying to belittle, they might actually be better than you. Sometimes you belittle somebody, but that person is better than you. hundred times better than you. But you think you are better than them. What's the problem? There's no tazkiyah. There's no purification. Your soul has not been purified spiritually. Do you know whenever we make wudu, whenever we make wudu, ablution, we are purifying ourselves. Whenever we pray salah, we are purifying our souls. So the Quran is supposed to do what? We use a keem. The Prophet this was also his job. He purified the companions. He made them better people than they were before. Do you know some of the companions before they became Muslims? Some of them, they 
committed murders. Some of them, they committed zina before. Some of them, they used to drink alcohol and, 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 and all intoxicants. They, they, they had, some of them, they really had bad and a very bad past. Okay, their past was really negative and evil. But once they became Muslim, they became the best of the people. What has changed them? The Quran. What else has changed them? The tarbiyah of the Prophet The Prophet mashallah, has nurtured them, cultivated them, made them, made them better. MashaAllah, improved them in every way. Also, what was the other job of the Prophet The Prophet was teaching them about the book, the legal rulings in the Quran. And what's the last one? Well, hikmah and also wisdom, the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu So the Prophet Sallallahu job, how many things was it? To recite the Quran to the people, to purify them, to teach them about the laws, and the last thing, to teach them the sunnah, the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu the sunnah. Very good. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala said, وَإِن كَانُوا مِنْ قَبْلُ لَفِي ضَلَالٍ مُبِينٍ And verily they had been before in a man, in, in manifest error. Before the companions became Muslims, they were in manifest error, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala has said. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is, this is good news for all of us, guys. Everyone pay attention. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned this in the Quran. This is us right now. Or anybody who came after the companions. Allah said, also, and he has sent him, I, 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 to the Prophet, to Prophet uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa also to others among them, okay? Muslims who have not yet joined them. So those Muslims, those people who, became Muslims later on. Those who became Muslims after the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Those who became Muslims after them, after them, after them. And we are among them, insha'Allah ta'ala. Wa huwa al-azizul hakim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said, he is the almighty, the wise. Look, Allah has repeated the same name. Okay, those two names, al-aziz, al-hakim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's, he's not only the almighty, who's not only just strong, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also is, res mashallah, respectable as well. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deserves respect as well. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after that has said, such is Allah's favor that he grants it to whoever he will. Allah's favor is immense. Wallahu dhul fadlil azim. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is gonna, the Quran, the beat of the Quran is, the Quran takes within one chapter or within one surah, the Quran takes you from one scene to the next. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is, there's no better director than, the, than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us a surah of the, for example, a surah of the Quran, he will talk about different things. And I want you to understand this, uh, this point very well as well. Sometimes you may hear someone who says, someone who says like, okay, this is how da'wah should be given. Sometimes you might hear someone who says, da'wah should be given by doing this, this thing only, or concentrating only on this thing, this particular topic. But look at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when you look at the Quran, every surah that you look at, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about multiple topics. He doesn't just talk about, he doesn't just concentrate on aqidah and says, okay, it's all about aqidah, nothing else. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about different things within one surah. And that's how the da'wah should be done. So sometimes we should be doing aqidah, sometimes we should be doing fiqh, sometimes we should be doing sirah, sometimes we should be doing the Arabic language. Different things, like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does in, within the Quran. Have you, not, have you witnessed that right now? Whenever we are reading the Quran right now, we are seeing, we are going from one topic to the next, to another topic, to another topic, to another topic. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us, this is the way we should be doing da'wah, this is the way we should be educating the people. مَثَلُ الَّذِينَ حُمِّلُوا التَّورَاتِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now, He's going to tell and, and tell us those people who came before us, okay? But they have not benefited from the knowledge that they had. This is a danger. Sometimes if you have knowledge and you don't act upon the knowledge, what is going to happen? What's going to happen is you are going to become like a donkey. You know, like a donkey. Look what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about this particular group of people. Allah said, مَثَلُ الَّذِينَ حُمِّلُوا التَّوْرَةِ Those who have been charged to obey the book of Torah, the book, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who was given the book of Torah? Which prophet? Mm. Prophet Musa alayhi salam. Prophet Musa's book. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, the likeness of those who were entrusted with the obligation of the Torah, okay, the book of Torah, is as the likeness of a donkey who carries huge burdens of books. Imagine an, a donkey and that's carrying a, a large number of books. 
the donkey will not benefit from the books. The donkey can't read the books. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is saying to us, if you guys learn the deen and you don't act upon it, what's going to happen? You are just going to be like that donkey that is carrying so many books, but is not benefiting from those books. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, those who came before you, okay, the people, the Banu Israel, who were given, the, who were entrusted with the book of Torah, they have not followed and, and followed the guidance that was in that book. مَثَلُ الَّذِينَ حُمِّلُوا التَّوْرَاةَ ثُمَّ لَمْ يَحْمِلُوهَا كَمَثَلِ الْحِمَارِ يَحْمِلُوا أَسْفَارًا بِئْسَ مَثَلُ الْقَوْمِ الَّذِينَ كَذَّبُوا بِآيَاتِ اللَّهِ Allah does not guide, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, those who have been charged to obey the Torah, but do not do so, are like donkeys carrying books. How base such people are who disobey Allah's revelation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said. وَاللَّهُ لَا يَهْدِ الْقَوْمَ الظَّالِمِينَ Allah does not guide people who do wrong. قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ هَادُوا It was said, the Yahud, the Yahud, okay? What, what did the Yahud say? They said, we are the friends of Allah. What did they say? We are the allies of Allah. The Yahud. They said, we are the allies of Allah. So this was a challenge to them right now. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the Prophet, O Muhammad, say to them, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ هَادُوا O you, you who follow the Jewish faith, those of you who are from the Yahud, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to them, in za'amtum, if you, if you truly claim that out of all people, you alone are friends of Allah, then you should be hoping for death. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this was a challenge to them. Remember, when the Prophet was in Medina, who else lived in Medina? The Yahud. When the Prophet was in Mecca, he, he did not encounter any Yahudis, but he encountered the Yahudis when he moved to Medina. So they claimed, the Arabs are not the allies of Allah. We are the allies of Allah. We are the friends of Allah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to them, Ya Muhammad, say to these people, if you are the friends of Allah, wish for death. Wish for death. Die, and then God will look after you after that. He will take you to paradise. So wish for death right now. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, وَلَا يَتَمَنَّوْنَهُ أَبَدًا بِمَا قَدَّمَتْ أَيْدِي Allah said, but because of what they have stored up, for themselves with their own hands, meaning they know how many bad sins that they've done in the past. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said, "Wa la nahu abad." They will never wish for death. They will never wish for death because they know they have done a lot of bad deeds. And Wallahu alimun bid zalimin. And Allah Subhanahu wa Taala knows the wrongdoers very well. And then Allah Subhanahu wa Taala now He's going to kind of like tell them the reality. قُلْ إِنَّ الْمَوْتَ الَّذِي تَفِرُّونَ مِنْهُ فَإِنَّهُمْ مُلَاقِيكُمْ And then the Prophet ﷺ said to him, Ya Muhammad, say to them, قُلْ إِنَّ الْمَوْتَ الَّذِي تَفِرُّونَ Say to them, the death you run away from will come to meet you and you will be returned to the one who knows the unseen as well as the seen. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to them, guys, you are trying to run away from death, but you can't run away from death. I am going to come and get you. I'm going to come and get you. You're going nowhere. قُلْ إِنَّ الْمَوْتَ الَّذِي تَفِرُّونَ مِنْهُ فَإِنَّهُمْ مُلَاقِيكُمْ ثُمَّ تُرَدُّونَ إِلَىٰ عَالِمٍ غَيْبِ وَالشَّهَادَةِ فَيُنَبِّئُكُمْ بِمَا كُنْتُمْ تَعْمَلُونَ And he will tell you everything you have done. So look at so far. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the beginning of the surah, what did he talk about? He talked about everyone, everyone glorifies Allah. Those things that those in the heaven and also those who are in the earth, on this earth. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked about the messenger and what was his job. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked about those people who will come after the companions who will become believers like us. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked about the Yahud who failed to follow the guidance of Torah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us, don't be like them. Those people, they have been given a book, but they never benefit from the book. Don't be like them. You have been given the Quran right now, you have to benefit from the Quran. How do we benefit from the Quran? By learning it, getting the guidance out of it, and then after that, what, are we need, to, what do we need to do? To apply it. Is that clear, brothers? Yeah? So, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked about, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has challenged the Yahud. And he said to them, if you guys are claiming to be my friends, wish for death. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to cause you to die right now. Im imagine if I know for, for sure that I'm going to go to Jannah. I want to die tonight. I don't want to live anymore. I would say, yeah, Allah, <laughs> take my life right now. Because I, I know that you're going to take care of me and I'm going to go to Jannah. Okay, you wouldn't want to be here. But we don't know whether we're going to... Also, remember, if you are a believer, 
every single day that you live. The longer you live as a Muslim, is the better. Why? Because every single day that you live as a Muslim is an opportunity for you to increase your ajr. But for a disbeliever, every single day he lives longer, the longer a disbeliever lives, is going to be bad for him. Why? Because every single day that he lives, he's earning the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more and more. And also, he's committing sins. He would not have committed if he had died early, early, earlier on. Okay, so that's why Abu Darda radiallahu anhu used to say, he used to say, death is good for the believer and is good for the disbeliever. Who said that? One of the companions, Abu Darda. He said, death is good for the believer and is good for the disbeliever. The, he was asked, why did you say death is good for the believer and good for the disbeliever? He said, it is good for the disbeliever because of the following. Allah said, those who disbelieve, they should not think. When we give them the respite, when we give them long life, we are not delaying their death because we want good for them. No. We allow them to live longer for what reason? So they can actually accumulate more sins. So Allah SWT said, I allow them to live longer sometimes and the kuffar so they can accumulate and commit more sins so they can be punished more in the next life. Okay? And Abu Darda said, he was asked, why did he say it's good for the believer? He said, the reason I said it's good for the believer is the following. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, what did he say? لا يغرنك تقلب الذين كفروا في البلاد متاع قليل ثم مأواهم جهنم وبئس المهاد And then Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala لكن الذين اتقوا ربهم لهم جنات تجري من تحتها الأنهار خالدين فيها نزلا من عند الله وما عند الله خير للأبرار Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala said What is awaiting for the believers, the righteous people is better than what they have in this world So, so far you can see we talked about different topics Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala talked about different topics within the surah the last topic Allah is going to talk about in this surah, the last passage is about the Friday prayer. It's about what? The Friday prayer. This is the only place where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked about the Friday prayer in the Quran. So now you know it. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, idha nudiya lissalati min yawm al-jumu'ah, fas'aw ila dhikrillah. What did Allah say? Ayah number nine. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, O you who believe, idha nudiya lissalati min yawm al-jumu'ah. When the adhan of Salatul Jum'ah is made, fas'aw ila dhikrillah, run towards the remembrance of Allah. We're going to ask ourselves a number of questions. The day of Friday, number one, if someone asks you which day is the best day of the week, what are you going to say? The day of? The day of Friday. The best day of the week is the day of Friday. The day of Friday, what happened? What are the things that happened in this day? This was the day when Allah has created Prophet Adam alayhi salam, our first father. He was created in this day, the day of Friday. This was the day he was told to leave paradise, the day of Friday. The day when the day of judgment is going to happen is going to be the day of Friday. Okay, so the day of Friday is the best day of the week. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has guided the ummah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to make this day the sacred and special day. The question now is, the day of Friday or the Friday prayer, when was it legislated? When was Friday actually made obligatory at the beginning? When was it? Was it when the Prophet was still in Mecca or when he lived, when he moved to Medina? There was no Friday prayer when the Prophet lived in Mecca. So this is something you need to learn. There was no Friday prayer. There was no Friday prayer. The Prophet never prayed a Friday prayer when he, was in Medina, when he was in Mecca. 13 years as a prophet, the Prophet ﷺ never performed Salatul Jum'ah because it was not made obligatory. That's number one. When was Friday prayer made obligatory? It was made obligatory when the Prophet ﷺ moved to Medina. So when the Prophet ﷺ came to Medina, that was the first time the Muslims prayed Salatul Jum'ah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now is telling us, O oh, you who believe, when the call for Friday prayer is called, you have to stop whatever you were doing and you have to go to the masjid, especially if you are a man. Women don't have to come for Friday prayer. But man, a Muslim man, has to stop whatever he was doing and he has to go to the masjid. Unless you are not feeling, unless you are unwell, or unless you are traveling. If you are traveling, you are a man, you are traveling, you don't have to pray Friday prayer. Okay? If you are a man 
and you are not able to go to the Friday prayer because you are unwell, you don't have to go. But if you are feeling well and you are not traveling, you are in your own city, okay, or you have gone somewhere else and you are staying there quite a long, a long while, you have to go to the Friday prayer. So right now, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu idha nudiya li salati min yawm al-jum'ah fas'au ila dhikrillah wadharu al-bay' and also leave off business. You cannot do business that time. Khalas. Imagine you own a shop. When the Friday time comes, you have to close your shop and go to the salah. Okay? Fas'au ila dhikrillah wadharu al-bay' Allah said, dhalikum khayru lakum in kuntum ta'alimun. That's best for you if you know it. The next question now is, fa'idha qudhiyat al-salah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, look what he said. Fa'idha qudhiyat al-salah. When the salah is finished, when the Friday prayer is finished, فَانْتَشِرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ Disperse in the land and seek out Allah's bounty. Meaning, you can go back to your work, go back to your businesses. Okay? Earn your income. Go after the salah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is commanding us to do that. But it is not an obligatory thing. Okay? You don't have to go to work after salat al-jum'ah. Okay? You don't have to open your shop. Okay? But it's something that you're allowed to do. وَذْكُرُوا اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا لَعَلَكُمْ And remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a lot, maybe you will become successful, you will prosper. The last ayah of the surah, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about an incident that happened during the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَإِذَا رَأَوْ تِجَارَةً أَوْ لَهْوًا إِنْ فَضُّوا إِلَيْهَا Look at what the companions have done. There was a day when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was delivering the Friday khutbah. Just imagine Sheikh Saeed Salah delivering the khutbah here, yeah, in the masjid on a Friday. And then as he's delivering the khutbah, everybody who was in the masjid, the masjid was full, for example, yeah, everybody who was in the masjid leaves during the khutbah. Only 10 or 12 people remain behind. Everyone else leaves. Would that be good or really bad? And the khutbah hasn't finished yet. The khutbah is still on. People just leave. This is something that has happened to the Prophet ﷺ one day. He was delivering the khutbah and the companions, they abandoned the Prophet ﷺ, they left him. The question now is what caused them to leave the Prophet ﷺ? The Prophet ﷺ, Allah SWT is telling us what caused them to leave. وَإِذَا رَأَوْ تِجَارَةً Allah has said, and when they see some merchandise or some amusement, okay, what happened? That time, they leave the Prophet ﷺ. In fadlu ilayha, they disperse headlong to it, meaning they leave you, they abandon you. Okay, yet they scatter towards trade or entertainment whenever they observe it. Imagine the companions doing that to the Prophet. ﷺ. It was said this day a caravan, a business caravan, walk, came into the city. And there was the, those days when a caravan comes that had so many goods, for example, and products and goods for, for sale and things like that. What they used to have, they used to have a band, okay, music band, that used to go ahead of the caravan, the camels and things like that, and they would beat the drums to tell the people of the town that, the, that right now the caravan is here, so you can come out and buy, buy whatever you want to buy. So that was, that was what they used to do, that was the culture. So as the Prophet ﷺ this day was delivering the khutbah, the drums were beating, Okay, and also, also the, the caravan came into the city. People were looking forward to the caravan and what it was carrying, and they wanted to buy goods and things like that. So they abandoned the Prophet. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, mm-hmm. Say to them, Qul ma inda Allahi khair. What is with Allah is better. How many companions actually remained in the masjid when this incident happened? Only around 12 of them, 10 or 12 of them. Who were these companions? Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr, Umar ibn Khattab, Uthman ibn Affan, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Abdurrahman ibn Abi, like the 10 major kind of like big companions. Bilal was one of them who didn't go. Ammar ibn Yasir, he stayed. Okay, if all of them left, if none of them remained, they would have been punished. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have punished all of them. But alhamdulillah, some of the companions remained. They didn't leave. It was said at the beginning, Friday prayer, the salah used to come. Now with the Friday prayer, what comes first? The khutbah or the salah? Which one comes first? The khutbah comes, yeah? But before this day, before this day, what used to come first? The salah and the khutbah used to be second. 
So the salah used to be prayed and then the khutbah used to follow. But after that day, what happened? It was reversed. So what happens right now? The khutbah goes first. If you leave during the khutbah, does that mean you've prayed your Friday? You still have to wait for the salah. So when you come for the khutbah, can you leave the khutbah right now? No, because you're still waiting for the salah. Can you see the wisdom behind it now? That's how it, so that's how it came about. So before this incident has happened, the khutbah used to be, the salah used to be first, and then after that, the khutbah used to be delivered. But after that, after this incident, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has actually commanded the Prophet sallam to make the khutbah first, and then after that to deliver, to pray the salah. Is that clear? Yeah, أَوْ إِلَيْهَا وَتَرَكُوكَ قَائِمًا قُلْ مَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ خَيْرٌ مِنَ اللَّهِ Say to them, Ya Muhammad, Allah's gift is better than any entertainment or trade. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's the best provider. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's the best provider. As you can see, alhamdulillah, we have covered the surah and we talked about different topics within the surah, alhamdulillah. So this, these are the takeaways. I want you to, what we're going to tonight is, what is our takeaway from this, from this lesson? One of the takeaways from this lesson is the following. When you make dua to Allah, ud'u Allah bi asma'i. When you make dua to Allah, make sure that you mention his names before you make the dua. What do you do? For example, you want to, you want to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you. So what are you going to say? Ya ghaffar, ighfirli. Ya Allah, the one who forgives, forgive me. Okay, so you mention the name. Ya ghaffar, for example, forgive me. Okay? For example, you want to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy upon you. Ya Rahman, irhamni. So you mention Allah's name first, and then you ask the dua. Okay, so you can do that. So that's one lesson that we can learn from this surah. Another lesson we can learn from this surah, a takeaway is going to be, اِعْمَلْ عَمَلًا بِالسِّرِّ لَا يَرْطَلِعُ عَلَيْهِ غَيْرَكَ Okay, do actions, good actions in private that no one else can see except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are aware of that action. Okay, sometimes, sometimes shaitan makes us do good deeds when other people are present. It doesn't mean that we don't do good deeds when people are present. Do good deeds when people are present. But also you should have something which is between you and Allah and nobody else knows that. Okay, sometimes let's say, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu sometimes he would go to certain people and who were poor people or old elderly people and he would visit them alone. Abu Bakr, he has learned that from the Prophet Sallallahu Abu Bakr sometimes during the night, even though he was, the, he was the leader of the Muslims, he would go by himself secretly without anybody coming with him. He would go to someone, an elderly woman's house who was blind. He would go cook food for her, clean the house for her, and then leave during the night. And no one else knows that. Umar ibn Khattab, he found out that Abu Bakr, he goes during the night somewhere where no one else is aware of. So he, he followed him until he found out where he actually goes. He goes to a particular house. And then the next day, Umar anhu went to that house and he found only there was an elderly lady, blind. She didn't know who, what was happening. And he asked her like, who's this man that comes to, comes to your house during the night? And what does he do? And she said, this man, I don't know him. He comes to my house in the evening, he cleans my house, he cooks for me, and then he leaves. SubhanAllah. And who is this? Abu Bakr anhu. He is the best of this ummah after the Prophet Sallallahu And he was the leader of the believers when he used to do that. Just imagine the prime minister or the king or the queen going to someone's house privately during the night and doing this stuff for them and then going back without anybody even knowing about it. Subhanallah. It was mentioned, one of the, it was, I believe, Zainul Abidin. When he died, they found out he had marks on his shoulder and back. And then when he, they were washing, when they were washing his body, they found out these marks on his back and on his shoulder. And then they found out what he used to do during the night. He's the grandson of, the, of, of Ali radiallahu anhu. He's the grandson Ali radiallahu anhu, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Zainul Abidin, Ali ibn al Hussein ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib. It was said during the night he used to carry heavy bags 
and of, of, that contained food, and he would deliver it to the poor people of his city without anybody else knowing about it. And that left mark, a mark on his back. SubhanAllah. So that, that's the kind. So you should have a private good deed that you do, okay, that nobody else knows about it. Okay? So think about it. Maybe you might, you might start actually sending money to somebody who lives in a poor country or someone who's an orphan. You might actually look after an, an orphan that no one knows. Okay? So just you and those people who are dealing with the case, that's it. So you send money to, for example, a particular orphanage and then you say, I want to take care and sponsor one or two orphans. Do things like that. So private stuff. Okay? Or pray during the night when no one else can see you except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the middle of the night by yourself in your room. Okay? Even your mom, your dad, your friends, your brothers, no one knows about it. You wake up by yourself, you pray. Okay? That's between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you should have those secrets, alhamdulillah, and actions. How many lessons did we take so far, did we say tonight? How many takeaways so far? Two, Two takeaways. Very good. Do you want another takeaway? I'm going to give you another takeaway, yes, takeaway. Not Imran takeaway. This is a taqwa takeaway. All right, the tafsir lesson takeaway, yeah? So you have to say, I'm going to go for the takeaway tonight. Okay, so you should be saying, what takeaway am I going to have? Not Imran special, okay? This is taqwa special. All right, taqwa special takeaway tonight. So you have to remember this. So another thing, this dua, Salillah husn al khatim. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give you a good ending good ending, okay? To have a good end to your life. Okay? Have a good end to your life. Do you know many people, they don't have a good end to their lives. Just imagine right now, some people die while, recently I saw, I saw recently like a musician, I think he was Haitian, and he was, uh, I think he was a hip hop star or something, or a rapper or something. He was actually, he was actually doing a, a performance. And as soon as he finished his performance, he collapsed and died. He had a heart attack. Subhanallah. Just imagine that. Just imagine sometimes people who die doing haram stuff. So that's why it's very important, very important that you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give you a good ending. Okay. You don't want to die doing something haram. Okay, some people die while they're actually performing an act which is absolutely uh, forbidding in our religion. So inshallah ta'ala, you have to be very careful about this issue as well. So ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to do that. Those are the takeaways that we're going to take with us tonight inshallah ta'ala. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us uh, upon the religion, steadfast upon our religion, say ameen. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us those who take heed from the Quran. Which surah did we finish tonight? Suratul Jum'ah. What was the name of Jum'ah before? The, which, what? Al-Urubah. Well done, Zakaria. Al-Urubah. Jum'ah was not called Jum'ah before. It used to, the Arabs used to call it the day of Al-Urubah. Okay? And then after that, it was called Al-Jum'ah. Very good. The day of Jum'ah, what's special about it? The Muslims gather. That's, that's why it's called Jum'ah. It's the day when people gather together. SubhanAllah. And the Prophet ﷺ, in order for him to deliver his message, this, this was given to him. Because imagine, imagine if we didn't have if we didn't have Jum'ah. If someone asks you which one is the biggest lecture that happens, the, which lecture has the biggest attendance in the in the in, in the Muslim world? Which lecture are you going to say? The Friday, the Friday Friday prayer. There's no masjid except the, that masjid is full. Every masjid around the world, Alhamdulillah. Any masjid you go to in the world, Subhanallah, uh, Subhanallah, in a, on a Friday, that masjid is almost full, if not absolutely full. Sometimes people pray twice in the masjid, okay? This is a special day that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given the Muslims. So alhamdulillah is a special gift that Allah has given us. Okay, so don't miss Friday prayers. Let me tell you young brothers and sisters, especially the brothers, the sisters, they don't have to pray Jum'ah. If sisters are not praying Jum'ah, what salah do they pray that day? Dhuhr prayer. So sisters should not think, oh, I don't have to pray Friday, so today I'm off. Okay, you're not off. That day is not an off day. Okay, this, that day you have to, as a sister, you have to pray Salatul Dhuhr. Okay, what about, what about if you are sick? If you are sick and you can't come to the masjid, does that mean the brothers, they don't have to pray that day? What, what Salat are you going to pray if you can't come to the masjid because you're sick? Okay, you can pray Dhuhr and you can pray Dhuhr at home. So remember, 
Mashallah, you pray Dhuhr and you pray at home like Zakaria said. Very good. So remember these, these rulings are very important. The Prophet Sallallahu has said, if somebody misses three consecutive Fridays, Allah is going to put a seal on his heart. If you miss three consecutive Fridays for no good reason, for no good genuine reason, if you deliberately miss Friday three consecutive times, three consecutive days, Fridays, with no good reason, what that means is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will put a seal on your heart. The khair is not going to penetrate through your heart. It's quite serious. So always take the Friday prayer very seriously. Which salah is the most important salah we pray during the week is the Friday prayer. The most important salah we pray during the, the week is the Friday prayer. Which one is the, the second most important prayer that we pray during the week or the most virtuous? So the, mo the most virtuous prayer that we pray every week is the Friday prayer. Second most virtuous prayer we pray during the week is Fajr on Friday. Salatul Fajr on Friday. That's why the Prophet Sallam, Friday, Friday, Fajr Friday, which two surahs did he used to read Salatul Fajr? Surah to Sajda and Surah to Al Insan. Okay, so remember. So the most important salah is the Friday prayer that we pray during the week. The second most important one, or the most virtuous, second most virtuous one, is the Fajr of Friday prayer, of, of, that, of the day of Friday. So, inshallah ta'ala, all of these things that you are learning right now, you need to act upon them, inshallah ta'ala. So, this is where we're going to stop. Jazakumullah khairan, brothers. It's nice to see you, inshallah ta'ala. I want to see you week in, week out. All right? So inshallah ta'ala, know that I'm coming to you all the way from where? All the way from Manchester. I have to drive through the snake pass, the dark evenings and the rainy and everything, because I love to see you guys. Inshallah, yeah? So I want to see you as well. Barakallah feekum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.